Welcome to the Counting Capital Podcast, presented by Buchanan Street Partners. For informational purposes only and not to be relied on in any manner as legal, business, financial, tax, or investment advice, nothing in this episode is an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy securities. Join our host, Buchanan Street Chairman Robert Brunswick. Welcome. I'm Robert Brunswick and I'm Chairman of Buchanan Street Partners and I'd like to welcome you today to our Counting Capital podcast, where we bring knowledge to our clients, their families, registered investment advisors, and lifelong learners, teaching them a little bit about real estate investing, investing more broadly, and then some topical individual businesses that we might select for you. I'm very excited about today's guest. First of all, a good friend of mine. Uh, I'm on the company's advisory board and uh, just a great firm. So I'm pleased to introduce to you Ben Duran, uh, one of the founders and principals of Prevenio. It's great to see you. Uh, glad to have you uh, on board here today. We're going to have some fun. Great to see you as always. Yeah. I think the way we like to start this, our podcast off is to have the folks get to know you a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, so maybe some, some career path, if you will. So I think it would be great if you could share a little bit about that education, where are you from originally, uh, your business uh, acumen, those good things. Sure. So, uh, so, so grew up in, in Putney in southwest London. Um, and my grew up in a family where uh, my father, for as long as I can remember, was an investment banker. So I knew I never wanted to be an investment banker because I didn't see a whole lot of him when we were younger, even though we have a very close relationship. Um, but he worked for the old merchant bank, S.G. Wahlbergs, that you may remember. Sure. But, you know, always was curious as a, as a young fellow and um, never really knew what I wanted to do, candidly. And my dad always said, don't worry about that. You've got plenty of time to, to work out your path. Um, my folks actually moved to the United States in, uh, I believe it was the late 80s, 89, 90, and I decided to go to college Having gone to boarding school in England, I decided to go to college in the United States. Um, ended up going to Tufts University in Boston, um, which I loved. Um, uh, you know, loved Boston as a city, loved being at college in the States. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, and wasn't, again, even during college, wasn't completely clear what I wanted to end up doing with my life. And, you know, other than my father, in terms of people that I, you know, hold up on a pedestal, my grandfather, Jack, was someone else that um, was someone I held with really high regard. And, and he had been an entrepreneur his whole life. And so both my parents actually grew up in Kenya, in East Africa. Um, and my grandfather, Jack, and his brother, Danny, um, uh, built their business from the ground up to become one of the largest automobile and aviation companies in Kenya. Um, and at the time I was graduating college, uh, my grandparents had decided to move back to the UK after 50 years in Africa. Um, and my grandfather approached me and said, hey, what do you want to do after college? And I said, you know, I'm just, I'm not sure. What advice do you have? He said, well, why don't you and I go into business together? Um, and so I, uh, I joined my grandfather in a business called Conrico International um, that was um, one of the exclusive export distributors for Land Rover Group that at the time was owned by BMW. And what was fun for me um, during that time, apart from learning from my grandpa, um, was I got to take on a lot of responsibility in a pretty interesting industry. Um, and I ran the Eastern European business and so went and set up Land Rover dealerships in places like um, uh, Ukraine, um, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, uh, Macedonia, Romania, and got to travel, of course, to all these places. And it was at the time when, you know, Eastern Europe was coming out of, um, you know, the communist uh, era and were becoming capitalist economies. And so it was kind of a, a wild west. Um, and and so, so that was an amazing experience for me and taught me a lot about life and, and about business. But I'd always had this interest in financial markets, uh, probably through, through my dad. and. Um, you know, I, I remember meeting with a really good friend of my father's called Merrill Alpen, who had run a, a firm called Charterhouse Group in New York. And I remember going into Merrill's office and it was this huge palatial office with this big jade sculpture on his coffee table. And he sat me down and 
And he said, well, my advice to you is, is if you can get into a top 10 business school, go, go get an MBA. And if you don't get into a top 10 school, then go work. Um, so I was lucky enough to get into Columbia Business School um, in New York. And of course, you know, New York being one of the centers of uh, financial services, um, uh, that seemed like a great place for me to be. And I really spent my time at Columbia, um, apart from obviously, you know, going to my classes and making sure I got the right grades, but I spent all my time on Wall Street. So I would just take off down to the Wall Street firms and I'd, I'd, I'd bug people and say, hey, can I shadow you for the day? And I'd spend a lot of time on the trading desks. Um, and so by the time the interviews came around, I already knew all these guys, you know? And so, so it was, uh, uh, I, even though I went through the interview process, I ended up getting offered a position by Morgan Stanley uh, in their sales and trading summer internship program. Um, and at the end of that program, they hired me full time, um, you know, and without having to go into too much detail, I spent sort of the first half of my career, you know, in, in sales and trading. Um, and, and that was with Morgan Stanley and with Deutsche Bank. Um, and then in 2003, um, my wife and I, she, my wife Jen was pregnant with our first boy, Matthew, and we have, we have four wonderful sons. And um, before Matthew was born, we decided that we either wanted to be near my parents in, in the UK or near her parents in Southern California. Um, so we decided to move to Southern California, and um, I was lucky enough to get a job with a, with a hedge fund manager called Vantis Capital um, to run trading. Um, and uh, we lived in, originally lived in Pasadena at the time, uh, and then moved to Los Angeles, uh, spent about six years in LA, um, and had a, had a wonderful time, um, learned a great deal, probably got a little burnt out trading. It was pretty, uh, pretty hair raising. We were running a couple of billion dollars and traded uh, aggressively. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I decided that um, it was time to, to do something else. And so after a brief stint back in New York with Deutsche Bank, um, we came back to California. Um, and I started working with a firm called ICG Advisors in Los Angeles. And, you know, ICG was and is run by a, a wonderful guy called Jeff Asaf. Um, and, and Jeff had run the Best Earns Investment Consulting Group for 26 years before rolling out and starting ICG after the global financial crisis. Um, and I told Jeff, you know, I, I was sort of ready to do something a bit more entrepreneurial and didn't really want to be in a big firm environment anymore. And so at the end of, uh, at, at the end of 08, they decided to roll out of what had become JP Morgan and start ICG Advisors. And, and I got hired by them and was with them day one of the new firm. Um, and over the next several years, um, worked with the, with the ICG team, focusing on um, sourcing and underwriting um, primarily alternative investments, which I know we're going to get into, mm -hmm. um, and working, you know, working with some of the larger, larger clients at the firm. Um, in 2010, I was lucky enough to be introduced to a fellow called Bill Powers. And Bill had been at PIMCO for over 20 years, um, was one of the most respected uh, people on, on Wall Street, um, and, and Bill had retired uh, after a 20 plus year career. Um, I got introduced to him via a business school friend of mine and he decided to hire us at ICG. Um, and after about a year or so, Bill came to me and said, hey, um, in, instead of working at ICG and me being one of your clients, why don't you leave ICG and come become the chief investment officer of my single family office? And I'd always been fascinated by the family office ecosystem. It was always a bit mysterious. And, um, you know, many of these families, as we will probably get into later as well, tend to fly under the radar. They don't really want people to know who they are or get access to them. Um, but the family office um, label, the family office ecosystem had, be, had been getting talked about more and more at the time, even much more so today, obviously. Um, but that was attractive to me. And I had a lot of respect for Bill and Bill's a great guy and a fun guy to work with. Um, and you know, for the next almost five years, I, I ran Bill's family office as his, as his CIO. Um, and during that time, I spent a good deal of time um, networking with other family office uh, investors. And this, is, this could be the, the family themselves running their capital, or it could be someone like myself that was an internal hire um, tasked with running the capital. And, you know, we would get together and exchange investment ideas. And I, I, I really started to see a very clear trend in talking to these families um, in terms of what they were looking for. And it wasn't equities and bonds. Sure. Um, you know, they were looking to get access to 
um, areas like credit and real estate and venture capital and private equity. Um, and more specifically, not the Apollos and the KKRs and the sort of big household names. Really, they were looking for these smaller niche capacity constrained alternative strategies. Um, and, and when I looked at the advisory landscape, um, you know, the advisory landscape is, is dominated primarily by firms that have a heavy emphasis on uh, equities and bonds. And if they do alternatives, it does tend to be, you know, the larger asset gathering firms that are great firms, but not, in my opinion, what these families were looking for. And so um, I spoke to Kevin Murphy, who's, you know, is my partner and, and started the business with me. Um, we started talking about this in, in 2015. And I, you know, we talked about this idea of building um, an advisory business that focused exclusively on these niche alternative so classes. that's a great pause there because I think um, this will lead us into some of the other questions about Prevenio today, what it is, how it's evolved. But Morgan, Deutsch, uh, Vantis, ICG, Powers Family, yeah. Office, and then Entrepreneur Land, and starting <laughs> Prevenio with your partner. Yeah. So great foundation. You saw a lot. You learned a lot. You did it on other people's watch. If you were to just self-reflect for a second, Ben, about what you learned about your strengths, your expertise, your passions, your acumen on, in that journey that you then s kind of have brought forward at Prevenio, what, what would you kind of uh, describe those core competencies as? I think, um, I think I've always had a good way with people. Um, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a big fan of sales and marketing. Sure. Um, but as you well know, you know, really good salesmen don't have to sell. They just have to be passionate about what they do. Um, you know, I, I think that as I look back on my career, you know, my, bi my biggest skill set would be, I think, my ability um, to rally people, to get people to buy into an idea, to get people excited about things, and to be empathetic to what their needs are. Um, you know, I would say that I've, as a weakness, I think I've always been pretty risk averse when it comes to my career. Um, you know, I've always worked for other people until seven years ago. Um, and not that that's a bad thing. I think most people work for other people. Um, you know, but, but I, you know, I always knew that I needed to support my family and uh, I felt comfort in having a, you know, regular job. Um, even though I learned a great deal from my grandfather early on, you know, that was a business he had built, not myself. And so, you know, the, the, the leap into becoming an entrepreneur was, um, was not one I, I took lightly um, and one that was candidly terrifying. Well, you think about often your, your greatest strength be, can be your greatest weakness. So you talked about your weakness being aversion to risk. But I think from a client's perspective or your, you know, look at your customers that might be listening in to have you have that healthy aversion to risk and now mitigating risk and managing risk and assessing it yeah. is probably a strength of yours uh, as, as you think about, you know, your attributes. So uh, that's helpful. I think that frame of kind of your core competencies, your background is great to set up our conversation as we kind of move this forward. Um, you just got into why did you decide to become an entrepreneur and start Prevenio? Yeah. So let's go there now. Uh, so it's 2015, you and Kev are talking. Yep. He had, he has, you know, knowing Kevin, he's been an entrepreneur. Yeah. So he was the guy to probably help you push you out of the nest, uh, given your thesis of opportunity within the alt space. So talk about the formation of Prevenio and when that happened and what the, the base mission statement was and vision as you built it. Yeah, I mean, it started with, it started with this concept that I've already kind of described, sure. which is, you know, if we, if we went out and we just launched you know, an RIA business, which was just sort of a generalist investment advisory firm, it would have been really difficult, I think, to differentiate ourselves. You know, the idea for, for, for launching a firm that focused on alternatives um, came from the fact that that was relatively unique. And it also came from the fact that Kevin, during my time with Bill, because I was subletting office space from him down here, because Bill's office was based in LA, and, I, you know, and the drive was not going to happen, right? So, um, you know, I think Kevin started to see some of the investments that 
that we were doing at Bill's family office. And he was like, man, you know, you're doing this in credit, and you're doing this in real estate, and you're doing this in venture capital and this direct deal. Like, this is fascinating. Um, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, starting a business from scratch was, was pretty scary to me. Um, you know, four kids, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and a wife to support, um, you know, if my wife was still working, she'd probably be supporting all of us. You know, she was on the fast track until she, you know, decided that she wanted to stay at home and raise the boys, um, which we both, you know, you know, I was obviously supportive for whatever she wanted to do. Um, but she was really actually the one that pushed me in the end. You know, we, we, I sat down and I said, hey, this is the, you know, this is the business, this is the business opportunity, this is the idea. Um, and she basically just sat me down and said, it's time to bet on yourself. Um, and so that was what gave me really the impetus to go for it. Did, did you have a first customer? Were there multiple oh, yeah. customers? So, so had... that, yeah, that's important. One of our clients and friends um, uh, who, who allows us to use his name is Scott Mather. And, and Scott... The Scott Mather. The Scott Mather, who... Who you know, is? Who was the co-CIO at PIMCO, uh, recently left. But, but, it, but look, I, I knew Scott pretty well, got to know him pretty well during my time with Bill. And, you know, one of the smartest guys I'd come across, also one of the hardest guys I'd come across. Sure. Um, and I knew no one managed his money. And so I said, I said, listen, Scott, I want you to come out for two dinners with me. And I'm going to tell you about this business concept. And I just want you to rip it to pieces. Um, and he did on, on the first dinner. We went out. And then by the end of the second dinner, you know, he said, you know what? I love your model and I'll be your first client. Wow. Um, and, and that was a huge deal because, you know, Scott's a, a, a highly respected individual in the investment community, not just here, but, but globally. Um, and, and to have someone with that level of credibility, you know, buy into the model. And of course, Kevin had some important clients too that were part of the first um, round of, of our clients, including your good self and, sure. you know, guys that, you know, really lent credibility to what we were doing, you know, but Scott was sort of the real... To Bell, me, Bell Cal. it was it was a big deal when yeah. when he when he signed on. Um, that was when I really said to myself, "Man, we we could have something pretty interesting here." Um, so that was kind of the first. So one. today you manage uh, about a billion billion and a half dollars AUM. About a billion seven. Billion seven. Okay, and how many clients is that? Um, just under fifty. Okay, so uh, few clients. A sophisticated clients, you like clients that understand alternatives, and we're going to get into that, that kind of align with your goals. It's not just... Open to alternatives. They, they don't have to, to completely understand alternatives. Yes. But it's a good fit when a family understands that alternatives have a place in their portfolio. So a good launch for... So what does Prevenio do for their clients specifically? So, so the easiest way to think about our business is that a family essentially hires us um, on a non-discretionary basis to source, to underwrite and due diligence investment managers across what we think of the alternatives landscape, which, which is basically everything outside of stocks, bonds, and cash. And we can go into the underlying asset classes later, but that's essentially the way to think about it. Um, and we will then build them a customized investment portfolio across that alternatives landscape um, that we will then monitor and oversee for them. And so each client has their own custom portfolio. Each client invests into each of those in, uh, portfolio investments through their own entities. So we're not taking discretion with capital. Um, and then we, we monitor those investments and report on them. Um, and of course, come back to the table when we find interesting opportunities that we think fit their goals and objectives. So I think this is the right time to uh, couch for us. The, so give me three, four examples of a asset class within alternatives, mm -hmm. and then an example of an investment within that. Without giving you the names. Without giving us the names, yeah. sure. We, th we think, so, so let me go through the various asset classes as we think of them. Yeah. And it's, it's probably best to set this up in terms of, we, we approach building investment portfolios um, if you visualize a barbell. The left side of the barbell is what we think of as sleep at night capital. So these are generally strategies that are um, focused on generating cash flow, tend to be privately negotiated contracted cash flows, um, and tend to be in, in sectors that don't have exposure to or correlation to the market, right? So think of areas like private credit, like opportunistic real estate, 
like um, real asset leasing strategies, you know, owning portfolios of barges, owning portfolios of rail cars, where you're getting a you know, healthy, tax-efficient, distributed yield. Um, and in a world where, and obviously, in a world where interest rates were not paying much for owning fixed income, um, generating an 8 to 12% yield in strategies like that is, is pretty attractive. Um, the right side of the barbell is, is, is really a reflection of our structural belief in innovation. And that's within areas like technology, healthcare, biotech, where we're taking a structural 10-year view that the acceleration of innovation within those sectors is going to continue. And so there should be representation of those sectors within client portfolios. And those are usually represented within early stage venture capital through to, you know, call it Series C, Series D growth equity, but generally private vehicles. And with that, an associated higher degree of risk, or is Correct. it more of a tech? So the, le tech the, le the left side of the bar sorry to interrupt, but the yeah. left side of the barbell tends to be bigger than the right side of the barbell in terms of the asset allocation. In, in terms investment of the allocation. dollars at work, right? At the end of the day, what we're if you think about it, most of the families we work with, pretty much all the families we work with, have exposure to equities and bonds somewhere else. They run it themselves. They have it with one of the big brokerage firms. When they look at their alternatives portfolio, what they come to understand is that's actually the ballast, right? We've seen volatility in the equity markets last year. We really haven't seen any volatility for a long time before that, you know, other than pockets here and there. Um, you know, we were in a 40-year bull, mar bull market for bonds, the biggest bull market in equities ever, okay? And when they think about their alternatives exposure, it's about predictability, it's about cash flow, and then it's about taking these longer term, as you say, riskier bets on innovation in technology, healthcare, and biotech within their alternatives makeup. So what, I mean, there's a number of things you talked about. You talked about finding these investments. So how do you find these investments? How do you underwrite an investment manager? Well, there's finding them and there's underwriting them. Yeah, so, so, so sourcing is, is a big part of what we do. So um, the interesting part about investing in, in non-household name, meaning these smaller niche old strategies is you have to have been doing it for a period of time to, to understand what to look for, to understand where to look for it, right? So it's my family office network, it's conferences, it's third party marketing firms that go out and, and are raising money for some of these smaller strategies that aren't big household name funds. Um, you know, it's other consulting and advisory firms that we know and respect that we exchange idea flow with. Uh, in some, Probably you know, your clients. Our clients, our managers, like if, 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 you know, as you well know, every manager we invest with think they've got the recipe for Coke. Right. If they have money somewhere else, the hit rate on that's been pretty high. Right. Right. That means, someone, that means it's someone they really respect and have usually worked with and, and spent a lot of time with. Um, the real value, I think, I mean, look, sourcing is clearly a value. And just to give you a sense, I mean, last year we did 450 manager meetings and we allocated to 12 strategies over the course of 22. So it's a hard interview. It, it, it's a hard interview. It's 95 plus percent is- Thank it, we're, you. We're saying thank you, but no thank you. Right. Um, uh, we always try to give them feedback as to why, um, you know, but we, we start with a sort of macro thesis and we then look for strategies that fit that thesis and obviously then fit the goals and objectives for the specific family we're talking about. And we want to meet everyone in the universe. You know, we want to meet as many of these guys as we can, and then we try to narrow it down to the one or two strategies, you know, that we think are the best of breed. So that's not, that's, but two and a half percent of those manager meetings turn out to be an accessible choice for an investor. Yeah, and it, depend, it depends on the year, it depends on the thesis, it depends on, you know, how uncertain the environment is. Um, but yes, that's true. Yeah, so a lot of those maybe are capable, just wrong time for that strategy. Yeah, and exactly. And sometimes it's, you know, there's a certain opportunity set that plays out and you get out, right? Um, because there's a difference between um, structural asset allocation, sorry, strategic asset allocation and tactical asset allocation, right? Not to get too complicated, but most of our asset allocation work for families is strategic. But now and again, there are dislocations or opportunity sets that create tactical asset allocation decisions. So you've got me thinking about now you as the entrepreneur. Yeah. So have you built this out? You went from one client to 60 today. So talk about the infrastructure growth and the, yeah. the, 
the job of the entrepreneur and working in the business versus on the business? Because you strike me as a passionate investor that enjoys the investment side, which yeah. I'm going to call in the business. Yes. So let's talk for a second about on the business and how important that is to the success for your clients. I should have mentioned that as one of my weaknesses. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, luckily, my partner, for my partner, it's a strength. It's a strength, yes. It's a strength. And, you know, Kev, because Kev focuses a lot of his time on the business, it allows me to focus my time in the business. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and that's been a, 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 I mean, look, that's been just a, a huge impact for, for us as a firm. But I'd say our business has gone through transitions. You know, when, when we started, it was about generating revenue. Not that it isn't today, but it was all about generating revenue because we had to pay people, we had to support our families. Survive. Survive. Yeah. Um, you know, and there were many, many, not that there aren't today, but there were many, many sleepless nights, you know, worrying about that. Um, you know, as we got the business to a point where not, it wasn't necessarily profitable, but, it, but these are generally recurring revenue situations, the business was running, right? And we could pay people and we could turn on the lights and we could pay ourselves. Then it was a question of, okay, how do we go from that you know, to the next level? And so I'd say for you know, the first two to three years, it was, it was revenue generation was the, focus, the main focus. And then for the following two to three years, we really focused on institutionalizing the business, right? And so that was focus on you know, best practices with compliance, because candidly to me, the biggest risk to our business is compliance. You know, we're an SEC registered RIA, and I feel pretty good about getting it right most of the time on the investment side. We're, we're going to get it wrong sometimes. It happens. But the focus on being a compliant organization in the eyes of the SEC is a big risk. And so that was something we really focused on. And so in 2020, we brought Darren Chappell in. Um, you know, Darren um, was, was really strong in terms of his operational capabilities and his organizational capabilities. Um, you know, and then we've made some other hires around Darren over the last couple of years, you know, bringing in Reshma, our new chief compliance officer. We have an outsourced compliance firm. We have a really good outsourced IT firm to deal with, you know, cybersecurity and disaster recovery and, you know, uh, and all those other areas. And then thinking about the different verticals we have from an org chart perspective, um, you know, where we need to, um, where we need help, right? And so we have our, you know, our investment team, we have our, call it business operations and client servicing team. And then in the middle, we've got this, what we sort of think of as, you know, client portfolio management, mm -hmm. right? Which is really focusing on the portfolios, you know, where they're underweight, where they're overweight, you know. Reporting well. Rep and rep Com community weight, getting well. Correct. Yeah. And, the cl and the customer experience, yeah. you know, because we don't have a very scalable business. Everything we do is customized. Every portfolio is customized. And therefore, it would not work with us having 200 families. What's much more important to me than growth is the experience my existing clients have, our existing clients have, as a Provenio Capital client. And so having the support, that's what we're sort of solving for right now, is how do you build that support network without getting existing clients to feel like they're not getting access to me and they're not getting access to Kev? Yeah, to match the, the business model. So you were touching upon it a little bit. Thank you for hitting uh, kind of on the business. But as you're picking investment management, what are the, what's the credentials? What do you look for? When, what, when do you start to check that box to say this is somebody that we want to do business with and allocate to? The first consideration is, is, is this a strategy that we understand? Is this a strategy that has a sustainable and repeatable process? Does the team have the right pedigree in the right asset class for what they're doing? Is the size of the fund appropriate to the opportunity set that they're investing in? Um, are they transparent? You know, one thing I will tell you, there are a few black and white things for us. One of them is if, if a manager we're doing dil diligence on will not give us total transparency, we walk away, period. Like we don't invest in black boxes, we don't invest in quant funds, um, we don't invest in stuff that we don't understand because at the end of the day, we have to explain it to our clients. Sure. You know, we're a non-discretionary advisory business. Um, and so we really stay away from parts of the market that we don't understand. I would say in terms of um, you know, what I'm trying to get to, at, at what we as a team are trying to get to when we're underwriting a manager is really to answer this question, which is how do these guys have an unfair advantage over everyone else? 
That's really what we're trying to get. How to. do they differentiate themselves? How, it's, What's their it's secret more, but it's sauce? more than differentiation. Yeah. It's like, how, how is it what these guys do? Like, we have a, we have a credit manager in the metals and mining space, uh, without mentioning names. Sure. The metals and mining space is a highly technical industry. Very difficult to understand, very difficult to underwrite, okay? Historically, mining companies have had to raise capital through the equity markets. So there were really no private credit managers that focused on the metals and mining business. These guys came out of Glencore, recognized this opportunity, right, based upon their technical expertise in metals and mining to build a credit fund. So we have technical domain expertise, we have a capacity constrained, difficult, esoteric market, and we have um, lack of really any competition, where they were then able to go out on a really attractive risk adjusted basis and generate you know, 12 to 15% type yields on these types of, of investments. So those three things that you just named, do that one more time if you don't mind, because I think those are the thesis points for really how an investment manager differentiates himself. The other stuff, they report well, they, they've had a performance and a track yeah. record, they have a good reputation. Those have to be checked, it's, it's, but it's look, those it's, three. It's domain expertise. Domain expertise. It's, um, it's capacity constrained in efficient markets, right? And it's, and it's lack of like a lot of competition. You don't want to invest in markets where there's a huge amount of competition. It's why we don't do a lot in long short equity funds, right? Now, your world, there's a lot of competition, but there's domain expertise in, in what a real estate operator and a real estate investment does versus their competition. Absolutely. Right? And there are things that differentiate them. It's the same for a credit manager. It's the same for real asset leasing strategies. It's the same for um, you know, venture capital and private equity. So if you don't mind without naming mm. names, private credit commodities is what you just talked Not about. Not commodities, so, so, so think metals. of- Metals. So, so quick definitions. So the private credit markets really were born out of the financial crisis because post-financial crisis, banks everywhere basically pulled out of lending right. outside of the most traditional vanilla practices. And this created, um, this created a huge amount of demand for capital that the private markets then filled. The, the shadow banking environment, so to speak. Yeah. Private credit, it, yeah. It, it, it's, it's private, it's essentially private financings, right, of you know, lower middle market companies, for example. But what's interesting about that space is these are privately negotiated transactions with contracted cash flows that are essentially backed by some form of hard asset collateral at a 30 to 50% loan to value. So you're top of the capital structure, you're protected by hard asset collateral, um, you know, and then you've got a borrower that's, that's willing to pay you 12 to 15% because they don't have any other options. So just give me five industries, because you were talking about metals yeah. before, yeah. coming out of Glencore. Just give us an, as an example, three or four industries where that space exists. Because I don't think the, the broader listenership might understand the different ways private credit can put itself to work with different types of collateral. Yeah, I mean, it, it exists in the real estate industry. Absolutely. Right, real yeah. estate debt, we know, is, yeah. is, a, is a really attractive space. You know, I've mentioned the metals and mining industry, it, venture debt, even though venture debt is not a big area of focus for us, venture debt is an area where, you know, there's been a lot of activity. And there are candidly a lot, to be, on, to be honest, for me, it's about what, what part of the market do you transact? So where there's the least competition is in the lower middle market, where a fund that, let's say, has 200 million of assets under management is writing a 10 to $20 million check. They're never going to come across the Goldman Sachs's and the Apollos and the Aries that are writing right. 75 to $200 million checks. Very, very competitive business. Ben, one of the things that I've enjoyed most about my interactions with your firm and Prevenio is just learning about the alternative space. Yeah. And what I think is somewhat a, a mis understood segment of investing in terms of risk reward. I think a lot of people think alternatives are riskier than they might be. So what, how does somebody who doesn't meet your minimum investment uh, amount yeah. uh, access alternatives? Uh, or how do they learn about alternatives so that they can further their investment career and ultimately participate? The, the first thing I'd say is alternatives are as complicated as you make them. There are lots of um, sections of the alternatives landscape that are not complicated at all, um, you know. But if you're a smaller retail investor where, 
you haven't had much exposure to the alternatives landscape. What's interesting today is there are options. Um, you know, there are firms out there that have launched interval funds um, that, that are actually accessible for investors that have twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars and can get exposure to a portfolio of private credit investments or a fund of direct lending funds that are, you know, uncorrelated to the markets and can go out and generate, you know, an eight to ten percent type return. Um, you know, there are real estate investment trusts out there, as you well know. Again, which is another way for retail investors to access real estate. I think most. Um, Unsophisticated investors tend to feel like equities and bonds are their only options, and there are certainly good options out there in the alternatives world. I think that's an important takeaway. As we kind of wind down, and, and you've been, uh, this has been great, and I appreciate your time. What do you enjoy most about what you're doing today? So you've been through the conventional jobs, and you've now built a business that's standing up, doing well, been a firm with 60 clients, got great AUM, uh, you're having success. What do you like most about what you're doing today? I love going to work every day. Um, I'm fascinated by all the different asset classes that we get to learn about, um, you know, each and every day. You know, and what's I think the funnest part about my business in, a, in any given day, I can be looking at a, you know, real estate opportunity, a venture capital fund, a private credit fund, and some direct co-invest deal, all in the same day. You know, so the intellectual stimulation of that is is probably the thing I enjoy the most, as well as. Um, you know, the time we spend with our clients because we have a really fun group of clients. Well, you're well suited for it. And I think as my last question, um, we got a listenership that's made up of some younger people that are maybe in the early stages of their career. Yeah. So it might be uh, valuable for them to hear from you what recommendations you might make for them as they explore their business life, their business career, and the next steps. Get into a growth industry, I think, is number one. And if you can get yourself into a smaller firm where you can be given more responsibility early on. Like a lot of people say, oh, I gotta go do investment banking at Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs because that's the best training. I actually think the best training is going to some small boutique investment bank if you wanna be a banker. If you wanna go into my world, go get a job at a small you know, middle market private equity business or one of these small private equity, you know, private credit funds where you're actually gonna be rolling your sleeves up and, and understanding how to underwrite you know, companies and, and, and build a portfolio. So if I was doing this all over again, uh, you know, I would try to find a really good small firm where I can be given more responsibility early on. Absolutely. Well, uh, I will tell you, I'm, I'm proud to, first of all, be one of your investment managers, our firm, that we take that very seriously. And uh, we definitely uh, appreciate the process you went through. And it was that process in large part that made me become a client of the firm. And I'm proud to be a client uh, and also on your advisory board. So this has been great time today. And I'm sure uh, there'll be uh, lots of good feedback from our, our, our session. So I want to thank you all for listening in. Um, I'm sure you would all agree we had some good learning today with Ben Duran from uh, Prevenio. And uh, we look forward to our next podcast and having you listen in. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Counting Capital Podcast. To learn more about Buchanan Street Partners, please visit our website at BuchananStreet.com. Buchanan Street Partners capital you can count on.